Good evening and welcome to our roundtable series. Today our roundtable will focus on social marketing approaches to health communication. Um, before we begin our roundtable, I'll briefly introduce our program. Uh, uh, ma masters uh, in communication. Uh, in our program, students can choose from five different uh, concentrations, uh, public and media relations, political communication, digital communication, corporate and non-profit communication, and health communication. Our program is designed for working professionals, so we hold classes in the evening, and you can uh, complete the course at a full-time or a, at a part-time pace. You can also take classes online and complete your degree online, so it's really flexible. And if you want more information, you can uh, pick up this brochure. It's uh, available outside. And we also have a faculty present here, Dr. Barb K. Um, and uh, Paula Weisman, uh, you can ask any questions about our program from our faculty here. And now we will move on to our roundtable discussion. I'll first briefly introduce our uh, disting this distinguished panel of experts. Uh, to my left is Dr. Sharon Sutton. Uh, Dr. Sutton has over 25 years of experience as a social marketer developing social change initiatives for corporate, government, and nonprofit organizations, including AARP, U.S. Department of Agriculture, and Porta uh, Novelli. She has taught at a number of universities, including George Washington University, American University, and Johns Hopkins University. She is also the founder of Sutton Group the social marketing firm which was acquired by American Institute for Research in 2005. Dr. Sutton received her MS and PhD at the University of Maryland with a focus on research methods and consumer psychology. Then um, to her left is Ms. Leslie uh, Brenowitz. Ms. Brenowitz has extensive experience in strategic communication, campaign planning, branding, and public relations, having worked with a client list that includes the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Office on Women's Health, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the National Committee for Responsive Philanthropy, the Galvin Electricity Initiative, and the Campaign for High School Equity. A senior vice president at GYMR, she is leading a project to brand IT Week, a new joint meeting of four leading infectious diseases organizations, and is involved in strategy de development and implementation for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Future of Nursing Campaign for Action. She also leads consumer health outreach for the Vision Council. Prior to this, Ms. Brenowitz has worked at Vanguard Communications, Macro International, and Porta Novelli. She received her BA in Political Science from the University of Michigan and completed graduate level coursework in health education at the University of Maryland. Then to her left is Ms. Jill uh, Herzog. Jill Her uh, Ms. Herzog is an award-winning communications professional with 20 years of experience directing multi-year social marketing and health communication projects for government and corporate clients. She has developed several national public education campaigns about many of the nation's leading social and health issues, including substance abuse prevention, mental health treatment, and disease prevention. Her clients include the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, National Institutes of Health, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, U.S. Public Health Service, Food and Drug Administration, Veterans Health Administration, Department of Defense, and she has also worked closely with the Assistant Secretary of Public Affairs and the U.S. Surgeon General. Then we have uh, uh, Dr. Elise Levine. Uh, uh, Dr. Levine has a doctorate in marketing from George Washington University and a background in nutrition and health. She has over 15 years experience in social marketing, specializing in research and evaluation of health promotion interventions. Dr. Levine has worked at Prospect Associates, uh, now AIR, AED, and she has recently started working with uh, Booz Allen Hamilton. She has also worked ex extensively in Central America, which she will talk about tonight. Thank you. Um, I would now like to thank all of our panelists to take out their valuable time and be here to you know, enlighten us uh, with your uh, expertise on the subject. Um, I will uh, now ask a few questions from the panelists, and then we'll open the floor to the audience. Uh, my first question is uh, to Dr. Sutton. Why do you think social marketing approaches are becoming more popular in behavior change mm -hmm. campaigns? 
Oh, I'm glad to hear they're becoming more popular. Um, <laughs> I was um, thinking uh, when I had the opportunity to work at NIH, it was back in 1995, we published an article that was called um, Strategic Questions for Consumer-Based Health Communication. And the reason we did that was because we, I, some of my fellow workers, we were actually thought we did social marketing. And when we got to NIH, we realized they didn't. Not only did they not do it, but they didn't like it. And they didn't like us. And so it was like, why would that be? And you realized then, because you had so social marketing, as we'll talk about today, has a lot to offer. Um, but they weren't marketing people. They were health communication people. And so we said, well, why are we not using our own discipline, which is to understand our audience and design something that they would find of benefit? And so we came up with consumer-based health communications, which was just social marketing, but branded in a different way. Um, so I'm, uh, again, excited to be here. I think it has a lot to offer. I think there's a lot of ways it can be integrated. And I'm glad it's becoming like, let's do it. So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ms. Prinovitz, would you like to add something to that? I mean, I think my question should be, do you think uh, social marketing approaches are popular in <laughs> behavior change communication? You know, in some sectors, I think they are, well, I'm not sure popular is the word I would use, but um, people are interested in them. Um, I've worked in environments where I've had a heavy focus on social marketing. That is, um, to Sharon's point, the clients thought they were doing social marketing. They hired us to do social marketing, and then we did social marketing. Um, but whether or not I was in a situation like that, I was always doing social marketing because I failed to understand how you could market anything or convince people to do anything if you didn't do it from their perspective, if you didn't. Um, take the time to uh, learn about them and find out what the barriers were and find a way to address them instead of just, you know, otherwise it's just talking, right? And uh, the example I, I'll use is um, still today people will go to see their physicians and their physicians will tell them to stop smoking and they won't. Um, and why is that, right? Because just telling people to do something isn't, isn't nearly enough. So. Thank you. Um, Ms. Herzog, I, could you please uh, explain, like, uh, you know, um, how, uh, why is it social marketing is more effective than other approaches? So I'll give the military as an example. One of the um, really great challenges that I have in my position right now is Booz Allen is a huge defense contractor. And when I got to Booz Allen three years ago, not only had they not heard of the term social marketing, but they didn't do health communications either. The only health work they had was really health IT. So big deployments of health IT. They really didn't understand the true business of health communications and social marketing. And we swung at a few things and tried to get this work and tried to be involved in the NIH and you know HHS worlds. And we really couldn't make our footprint um, look any different than an IT company because they didn't know that we had the people that knew how to do this. So I thought, well, gee, there must be something in the military around health. Well, of course, there's a military health system. It's huge. It's one of the largest providers of health care in the, in the country. And what we failed to understand as citizens is the plight of the service members are very different than the average American walking around. And coming back from these particular conflicts, we were seeing these high rates of post-traumatic stress disorder, high rates of suicide, and aggressive behavior, um, high rates of divorce, traumatic brain injury, comorbidity between both traumatic brain injury and psychological health, and the military was stunned and didn't really know what to do and didn't know how to deal with the problem. So social marketing is a huge you know, gift to the military to say stigma is a problem, but you need to understand where the barriers are, and you have to start at the top and go down to the bottom. And I think um, having done this for so many years and coming into a new environment and being able to affect change, you know, really norm changing stuff. You know, you cannot get any more brawn that, you know, muscle and toughen and be uh, a man and a woman than in the military. 
So to be able to break down those barriers and understand what's going on with service members is an amazing thing. So for me, social marketing is you know something brand new again, and that's what I'll say about it right now. Dr. Levine, could you add something? Uh um, I can tell you that it was kind of a personal revelation for me when I was doing my undergraduate work in nutrition and I happened to take this elective in marketing and I realized, oh my goodness, these people know how to change behaviors. And you know, if you uh, get educated in any health science, oh, they might give you, you know, interview techniques or things like that, but no. These marketers, they knew how to change behaviors. And of course, we know it's not just individual behavior change, it's also the policy and the environment. And you know, uh, that's uh, something that we are continually working with. But that's when it clicked for me that you know, if, if you really want to get people making healthful choices, here is a, a well-known commercial application with these four P's, and boy, yeah, it, it really does work. It's more than just saying it. You have to have it at the right place and at the right price, be it a financial price or the price you pay with the time that's required. And you have to have the right product. And yes, there's a bit of promotion in there. And so that's when it clicked for me that you, you know, they had the marketers, I mean, had all this thought out already. Um, and it has really helped when I, I went on to take a, a master's degree in health communication, but I realized what they were talking about was really marketing. And then, you know, as, as life happens, it turns out that I got to teach that health communication course. So I started introducing social marketing. This was at Boston University. Um, and you know, back then, they were just kind of starting to get it. I, I actually you know, searched the journals, found it was coined in 1972 by, by two prominent researchers. And it just made so much sense to me. And as uh, I've been doing applications, um, I really keep going back to some of the basics of, of marketing with you know, what we know uh, very specific to health. But you know, just borrowing from that uh, field as well as psychology, as well as sociology, this mishmash that we have together, it, it's really necessary. So that's all I'll say now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, could you, uh, I, I will ask, you know, any of the panelists, like, what are some of the effective social marketing strategies that you can use for a health communication campaign? Well, I'll start. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll give you a lovely example that I had the great privilege to work on when I was in El Salvador and I was working with uh, contracting with PSI that's Population Services International. They had a, a program going on there for HIV prevention where I thought wow they really get it <laughs> and the reason why I was so enthusiastic was because it was not only these really fabulous promotional activities they did. They had a six foot penis, okay? You know, <laughs> and it's a mascot and you know everyone wanted to be the penis, you know. <laughs> that was part of it. I mean there it's a Catholic country <laughs> and they had to sorry Jill. And they, they, they had to they had to, you know, just say, look, you know, here we are with, you know, a bunch of teenage single mom births and, you know, everyone's scared of and not talking about HIV. Here's uh, Pedro the penis, you know. <laughs> and um, but that was just part of it. They targeted their segments well. They had segments for youth. They had segments for the commercial sex workers. They had segments for the uh, most um, uh, vulnerable, the uh, men who have sex with men, and they had different strategies for each group. Sometimes it was, you know, doing their interventions in a bar. Sometimes it was doing their interventions at a uh, internet cafe. They started an internet cafe because that's what was needed in these developing parts. 
So the Internet Cafe provided these young people with access to Internet for the first time. And oh, by the way, you earn points if you look at this online program about HIV uh, prevention. And you use those points for more Internet time or for snacks at the cafe. And then they looked at the price issue. And they realized that you can't just give away condoms because people don't value them. They blow them up, make them into balloons, and bat them around. So you have to have a price, but it has to be the right price. I was involved in helping them find the right price. And uh, they made their own, it was a generic uh, condom, you know, the same that's used by Trojan, the same that's used by all the big brand names. They just made the same product. They put their own brand on it. They marketed it. It had value. It had some sort of prestige. It was seen as, oh, this is a smart choice. So they got the price. They went to the right places. They had a good product. And they put in the Zippy promotion. And they made a huge impact where, where we were. And uh, this was like El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua. They, they just did a terrific job with their mission. So that's, that's uh, one of my best examples. Uh, I'll add uh, maybe not a program example, but you, know, you use the, the phrase social marketing strategies. And I think it's really important to recognize that um, the strategies that you're going to use come out of applying these methods, um, doing the research, Elise, Elise mentioned segmenting the audience. So if I was going to call something a, a strategy, I guess I might call it that. Um, and so, y you know, anytime um, you run into someone who says they want to do a social marketing program or they want to market something, they can use the word social or not, um, and then say that their audience is the general public, um, they're not going to be doing a social marketing program and they're maybe not going to be doing a marketing program at all. So. Um, you know, that's something to consider really um, carefully. And that segmentation can be on so many different um, variables. So, um, you know, Jill mentioned the military, and Jill and I actually worked together on a um, campaign to get young enlisted members of the military to um, try to quit smoking. Um, so if you look at culture as a variable, well, there's a culture of the military um, that goes back to, you know, World War II when they used to get cigarettes in their rations. And you can find quotes from generals saying that tobacco was as, as um, important to the war effort as the uh, bullets were. Um, and so, um, you know, you need to understand that. And you need to understand, you know, here's a really successful kind of social marketing campaign, the Truth Campaign um, in Florida and then nationally to get um, kids to um, reject smoking and and the approach was to tap into this idea that kids didn't like being manipulated by the industry and that worked really really beautiful and it was it was driven by kids and the ads were really kind of in your face and they had a lot of money to pay for advertising so that's that strategy works really well um, when you have a lot of money uh, to pay for your campaign um, but but here, Jill and I go into these military clients, and they say, well, we think that strategy of industry manipulation, that idea is going to work really well in the military. Luckily, they let us test it along with some other things, um, because here's what you learn. You can't tell Marines that they're manipulated by advertising, right? The, the whole job of the Marines is to be invincible. The whole training is to get them to think they're invincible. So, um, you know, there's an, so it's not like a strategy is a strategy is a strategy in social marketing. You, you've got to, you know, know who you're talking to. I'll just make two points about the audience. You know, the truth campaign could have backfired horribly, and actually many tobacco cessation or, um, you know, quit campaigns fail because they fail to find out what's important to the smoker. So for kids, we were talking about health benefits, and they could care less about health benefits. You know, give me a reason to quit smoking, and it can't be because I'm going to die when I'm, you know, 55 or 60, or because that's not going to work. Um, so one of the things that I really caution clients about is be prepared for what you're going to find out in your research, because it might not go the way that you think. And you know, the Marine story gets even sassier when it comes to telling a Marine that you know you're diagnosed with this you know lifelong chronic you know issue, and 
your wife is going to think that you're going to be drooling in a cup. You know, you say the words post-traumatic stress disorder, and nobody really understands what that is. And the Marines told us they would get new wives if they thought that they were no longer men. You know, whereas the guys in, uh, in the Army, their wives were a huge part of their seeking treatment, sticking with treatment, going forward, you know, moving forward. So how do you, you know, talk to these two completely different sectors and, you know, forget the Navy and the Air Force and the National Guard. I mean, everybody has a different need um, and a different way that they're going to hear a message. So those are really important and tough lessons. We did an underage drinking campaign many, many years ago. And one of the posters that I'm not sure, it, I think it was a university, said last year you drank 17 Olympic swimming pools filled with, you know, beer. And that was the bad news, right? 17. Next year, what did the kids do? 18. They drank 18. <laughs> So, you know, really you can't get any more serious than the research and, and that foundation. And from there, the strategies will fall into place. You can't just pick every strategy for every, you know, every tactic isn't going to work. I mean, in the military, we can't use certain things. In the, you know, with, you know, teenagers, you don't have access to, to some things. And money is a huge factor. So know your budget know your audience and keep your expectations reasonable and help your clients keep their expectations reasonable. Um, that's, you know, for me, a, a driving thing that I keep in my head when I sit in offices. So I'm uh, going to add one thing. I'm going to add one thing on, this is so important. Um, and and, and this, is, this is what separates health information from health communication. Right, exactly. right? Health information is providing the facts. It's telling you the truth. It's telling you what the data show. And um, again, if you are a health person, a science person, you feel like, well, that's enough. That's what our job is. But if you're a health communicator, if you're actually trying to, and I always like to say, um, you know, uh, provide a message that allows people to do what's in their own best interest, um, which is not necessarily always the case, but, it, but this idea of understanding who the audience is. And so I'm gonna go, in the beginning, too, I had not a clue how to do this. You know, people kept saying to me, you needed a message strategy, you needed a message strategy. And I was like, well, wow. What, when, what does one look like? <laughs> How do you know it when you see it? And, and um, I had this wonderful opportunity to get to study with an ad agency in Chicago, back then called, I don't remember the name of the company. But anyway, they, they did this really cool thing, which was when you talk about a segment, and often you see this in public health a lot, they'll segment, but they will give you segments by demographics. You know, women are more likely to do this. Blacks are more likely to do this. The age groups, you know. And it's like, well, you know, you're giving me a demographic, but every person's got like that whole cluster. So that doesn't exactly work. And then even if you tell me the, you know, the data, it's like, I need to know who the person is. So, so the research people at this ad agency, they would spend enormous amounts of time trying to understand the segment. Then they would hire an actor or an actress to reenact the person. Because if you cannot, you only speak to a person. It doesn't matter if there's a million people in the segment or, you know, ten. You're speaking to a person. And so what they would do is they would take, and they have an actor and actress reenact their best picture of who this segment is, who this one, one person that would stereotype the segment. Then they would walk it down to the creative department and say, this is who you're talking to, all right? This is who you're talking to. And I would um, always love to give an example. It used to make people laugh. But in class, I'd say, think about when you really, when you fell in love. You really, man, you hit it. You hit it. This is the person. This is so great. Mm -hmm. And you realize that the things you would say about this person to your mother versus your best friend <laughs> were totally different. All right? That's because you knew those people. And here it was the same person you were talking about except one was your mother who was interested in X, <laughs> and then there's your friend who's interested in Y. That's because you knew them as people. And so when we do the segmentation, which is so, again, so key, you'd never talk to the public. You never. But to be able to crystallize them and turn them into a person is the only way you really can develop effective communication, health or otherwise. So 
this this is why we're all talking because it's so important <laughs> at this one point. Thank you. That was very <laughs> insightful. Um, I would now like to ask, like you know, we have the social media, uh, you know, uh, coming in, and social media is really popular among youth. Like um, it's that's one segment that's really using social media and is responsible for really promoting and it's also creating you know we can see the effectiveness of social media in developing countries or in you know middle eastern countries so how 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 can social marketers use social media so I'll take a, a stab at that. Um, it is just one of the tactics. It's not the only tactic. It's not necessarily the best one for many of the audiences that we're dealing with on some of the topics that we're dealing with. Um, it also is labor intensive and you have to have a plan. So, you know, try writing a social media plan to engage and again I'll go back to the service members because it's just on my plate right now um, you know service members in a conversation around psychological health good luck so really good luck because they don't want to talk about it they don't want to talk about it the military didn't want to talk about it nobody wants to talk about it and that's the other thing in, in combination with the social media issue is you have to be where your audience is and even if they themselves are not you know, as far along in your process, you have to meet them where they are. So when they said, we want you to talk to us, but we don't want to have a .gov or a .mil website. So we have a .net website. And we want to chat with you, but we don't really want to have to put in our ID or any of our numbers, and we don't want to leave any trace that we might have called. And we're like, okay, wow. So we are in an anti-stigma campaign, and that is so stigmatizing, I want to hide under the desk. But you have to be where they are. So we went in and told the client, they don't want this, they don't want that, they don't want this, they don't want that. And again, you've gotta be willing to accept that call from your audience. So social media for the campaigns that I've worked on have been either everything, Twitter, I guess Delicious is gone now, or Dig, or one of them is missing, I don't know, they've, they've disappeared. Um, you know, Facebook is not just youth, it's actually women my age are the largest users of Facebook at this time. Um, so again, it's, they serve their purpose. They are just one of many tactics. Do not get hung up on any one tactic and don't assume that every campaign needs social media. It's not like you need to have a business card or you need to have a, you know, you have to choose what's gonna work best for your audience. But I find that, you know, we've actually even used some different social media tactics because while you're fighting a war, you can't get on Facebook or YouTube, but they do have TroopTube, which is just like YouTube, but for the military. So you also have to investigate these underground and unknown and things that are not, you know, in popular culture. So, you know, again, keep turning the page, keep looking for that next best thing and don't assume that it's, that social media is for everybody. And by the way, Everybody gets social media and social marketing confused. So just, yeah, every, every, I don't know anybody who doesn't unless you're in this field. Um, I, I think, you know, in a sense, it's not different from any other tactic you would do, except that it's everywhere. And I agree with Jill, it's, it's very labor intensive, but it's also easy in the sense that we all know it. Oh, my, you know, 12 year old daughter has a Facebook page or, you, you know, whatever. So, um, you know, I mean, this is an anecdote, and then I'll get back to my main point. I was working with a client, and they had a different um, social media vendor. Um, <laughs> you can tell where this is going, but, you know, the mechanics of it, we all know, are, are easy. And I had to finally say to my client, like, you know, your 10-year-old daughter could do that for you, but it's what you're saying. So whatever media you're in, what you're saying really matters, and in, in social media, um, you've got to understand why people are there and how they're using it. So, um, you know, is it appropriate for you to have a message that will intrude on whatever they're doing? Um, or, you know, are they, or can you find a way to have them come to you if they're interested? Um, Facebook, um, you know, fan pages and all this stuff have, have a certain place. You can also buy really inexpensive, relatively speaking, um, advertising on Facebook that's incredibly targeted, right? Because you can target a zip code and an age range and people who like baseball and, um, you know, any of that. So uh, it's really interesting in that way. Um, you know, it, it all always comes back to 
you know, what you want to do, who you want to reach, what they're doing now, what they think. And, and I'll give you an example of um, something that didn't work um, that um, we thought was worth a try. Um, we were trying to reach psychiatrists um, to inform them about a, um, a study and then a, a lawsuit that was filed against a pharmaceutical company by the attorneys general and, and won um, because they were off-label marketing um, so that's when you have a drug that's approved for one use, or they call them indications, and you market it for something, for something else. Doctors can prescribe it for something else. That's totally cool. But um, the, the pharmaceutical company can't market it for something for which it's not approved by the FDA. So among other things, we thought, well, let's do a mobile marketing, you know, text campaign. And it's one of these things, you know, it's not intrusive because people have to sign up for it. You're asking for their permission. That's the other thing. I think you've got to ask permission, you know, not just start showing up um, all the time. you got to let people opt out. But anyway, um, long story short, we found out that in, in this demographic that we were trying to reach, psychiatrists, they didn't know how to send text messages. They, they, their phone would beep. They wouldn't have any idea. You know, it just, it didn't work. We worked with the people who did Obama's mobile marketing campaign for the 2008 election, and we all know how successful that was. Well, it sometimes just doesn't translate. So, um, you know, and, and so, you know, sometimes you experiment with things and they don't work and you, and you learn. But, um, you know, social media, um, are ubiquitous, you can target, but you know, I would just say, don't be dazzled. Mm -hmm. And I would say in any of these mediums, a website, any social media applications, if you build it, they will not come. <laughs> you must, they will not come. They do not come. And you know, that's the other really fun person to add to your budget when you're trying to convince a client that these are the people you really need to run your project. A, you need the guy or gal who's going to sit there and tweet and Facebook all day long or create the plan and how it's going to tie into all the other things that are going on in your agency and under this topic and with the studies that are being released. But you need the marketer. You need the person who's actually going to do all the meta tagging on your website and get all your articles to you know come to the top of the list. And that's not fun. That's not a fun, you know, that's a really tough job. And every word that's written in, you know, a tweet or on Facebook or on a web page has to be, you know, so calculated so that you get the people that you're supposed to get and they can find you easily. So m marketing those things are, are just as important as having them. Having them is great, but if nobody's coming, it's not a party. Uh, thank you. Um, I would now uh, like to ask Dr. Levine. I mean, you know, when I first time heard about social marketing for health communication, it was in India, and I learned that all HIV AIDS communication campaigns were targeted to women. And it uh, so happened, the research showed that, you know, women actually are not the decision maker, That's it's right. the men, men. So then they started changing the strategy and targeting towards men. So, you know, research shows that uh, there is a difference between how social marketing campaigns work in US and in the developing countries. Since you have that experience, could you highlight some of the differences? Um, yes, I, I was very, um, thrilled and um, scared when I went over to Central America that I had just finished my graduate studies and you know I I didn't want to come across as oh here I am to save the day because <laughs> I I knew that you know the the culture had to be respected and I and I knew that there's strengths in the Latino culture that I needed to know first so I just for the first year I just uh, practiced my Spanish and I watched and I listened and then it it did appear that there's more similarities than differences. So, you know, some of those basic guideposts about social marketing still hold. You know, you still have to segment carefully. You still have to find who are the influencers, as uh, Priyanka had, had said. And you still have to find where are those windows of opportunity to reach them. But you have to have someone who's 100% culturally competent, you know, guiding you there. I could not come in, 
you know, as someone from a Western developed country and just apply what worked in the U.S. to what's going to work in a developing Latino country. Uh, so I embedded myself with, you know, groups like UNICEF and the um, universities that had public health departments there. And, you know, it, it really had to be a good partnership there. I had some techniques, I had some neat tools in my toolbox as a social marketer, but none of it would work unless you understood the culture. So I depended very, very much and you know, no surprise, I learned so much from them. They they really are leaders in community-based participatory research, for example, where, you know, the intervention is the research. And through the research, they discover what their needs are and what solutions are. But it's done at the grassroots level. They are masters of it there. And that was something that we don't use very much here. Um, but generally, you know, you, you need to keep those basic principles in place. You find they apply. You, it's absolutely important, just, just as you said, you know, to make sure you understand. And it's, it's as Leslie and, and uh, Sharon said, you, you just have to understand who you're dealing with, what are the hot buttons, and, you know, who do you have to talk to? Is it the husband? Is it uh, the Buddhist priest in Thailand was uh, very effective in HIV prevention there? Um, you know, who is it that you have to talk to? And you have to realize that they need to get messages from many, many different sources. Uh, so just make sure you get the proper lay of the land. And of course, you want to do that with um, the people who are there. and. Don't assume that you can go in knowing everything, even if you know that was your major in college. <laughs> you just don't. <laughs> I, I just I think also, and it's something that Elise alluded to um, before, that a lot of these um, social marketing type of campaigns in developing countries um, really are product marketing. And that's not something that we get the opportunity to do as much here mm -hmm. in the United States um, for a variety of reasons. Um, so um, it really is, you know, um, developing a product, branding it, pricing it, packaging it, all mm -hmm. of that, if it's, you know, condoms or mosquito nets or, or you know, these kinds of things. And, and that's a really big distinction, I think, um, that's just a, a practical thing. Um, and part of it is to, you know, because the agencies that are doing this kind of work um, need to fund themselves. Um, um, and then, you know, Elise talked about um, putting a value on, um, on the behavior or w which is a, a product-based behavior in, in many cases. Um, so that's sort of an interesting difference. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the difference between public health. I mean, That's public health and health care. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, because there are a lot of, you know, marketing of products and services here on the private sector side um, versus on the public side where you're trying to help populations be healthy or get people to take proper, you know, actions to protect themselves, et cetera. And so, but it gets, but the point is, is this is really interesting because people get so confused uh, in that so much of the history of social marketing came out of what was being done in foreign countries through USAID funding. And you can, you can do all kinds of things with USAID funding somewhere else, but not here. And, and so this idea of the product kind of complicated the thinking about social marketing in the United States because often when there is a product, it's clear. But in many cases, there is no product in a social marketing campaign, all right? What there is is what's called a benefit. You're offering people a benefit. You're offering them something they want in exchange for a behavior change. And that benefit doesn't have to be associated with a product. It could be associated with something you know, totally different. And so 
often you'll hear people, I've been in meetings where they've like spent out days, weeks, months trying to figure out what their product was. And I was like, you know, if you don't know, you might not have one. And so <laughs> let's just go on and figure out what's the behavior change, you know, who, who's the audience, what's the behavior change, and what are we offering them? Because that's the core of what social marketing is. And, and when you make the distinction between that and health information, again, it's one is more education. If I educate them, if I explain it, if I tell them why, they'll do it. Versus I need to offer people something that they care about, they wanted before I showed up, but I can now link that to what I have to offer to them. And, and, and that, I think, is a key differentiator. Yeah. And just to add, I mean, and it's not only messages, you know, I mean, I think th this always happens, but it's something to um, be aware of that we can focus so much on promotion um, because sometimes that's the really fun thing. Oh, let's put on an event or, um, you know, people will become fixated on I have to have an op-ed in the New York Times or, it, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but the other P's, right, there's four or even five sometimes people will add now um, policy or um, beyond. Um, but here's an example of um, this isn't uh, – I don't know the full extent of the campaign, but it's just an example that comes to mind that several years ago, um, if you wanted to buy condoms at a CVS store in the district, you had to ask for it. They were locked up. Okay. So if we're talking about, let's say, an HIV prevention campaign and one of the, the behaviors we want to motivate is condom use, um, that is certainly um, an environmental barrier, right, to condom use. And so um, there were some um, uh, people, I think from GW, I think it was like a class, you know, social marketing kind of project where they actually um, freed the condoms. So. <laughs> You, but so you got to know what's out there, you know, what you're asking people to do. Is it easy for them to do it, or is it even reasonable for them to do it? Thank you. Um, now I will open the floor uh, to the audience. Um, I was at the M Health conference a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago here in D.C., and there were all these new apps where, and I saw it on the Today Show, I think yesterday or the day before, where you could take a picture of your food and it would tell you how many calories and give you some educational information, blah, da, 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 da. I'm wondering if any of you have been involved in any of that type of um, effort. And two, one of the challenges is evaluating social marketing campaigns and social communications. And could you talk about, you know, how you evaluate what tools you use, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I can take the mobile one. Okay. So while we've not done um, a mobile application that sort of sizes up something that you're looking at, um, we did create a mobile application for diagnosing traumatic brain injury in, in service members. So it's a mild TBI. It came from a pocket guide. So one of the really interesting things, this is really more health information than it is social marketing, but it does have a piece of the pie. Um, mobile apps in general, I think, can do a lot to continue to move along behavior change. I don't think that they're going to be, like any other tactic, an answer. Um, I, they are also a highly, um, people who create mobile apps are expensive. It's a very targeted career choice to program. You know, it's super duper groovy and cool and clients get all shiny and happy when you walk in, you know, with your iPad and you're they pressing things. It is pretty sassy. And I've had great fun, you know, working with the, the creative folks in developing mobile applications. But again, put them where they belong, use them when, when you need them. In clinical diagnoses, it's awesome because it can happen in, you know, 20 minutes. You know, mild, you know, concussions are pretty easy to diagnose. There's like five or six basic symptoms. And if you get through the first, you know, five yeses, you have one. <laughs> so it's pretty, it's pretty easy. There are, so I, I would add them to the list of the things to look at, but again, they're pretty expensive also. Um, and the other question is the metrics. So be fair and honest with yourself as a social marketer that you are evaluating communications activities 
And unless there are baseline studies, so I'll take the military again. They do a study every three or four years. RAND does one, and then the military does one, where you actually, uh, they chart the number of diagnoses and people in treatment. So for our campaign, unlike things where you want numbers to go down, less HIV AIDS, you know, we want more diagnoses, more people in treatment. We want to see more numbers. So unless there's a baseline study that exists or one that they're going to pay for, it's pretty difficult, you know, especially in government projects, which is 100% of what I do, to do much more than the counting of the web hits and how long somebody stays on a page and how many pieces of your material are going out of a call, you know, a warehouse, how many numbers are coming to a call center, how many chats, how long are the chats. Um, you know, it, it's your basic, you're evaluating and, and counting things that people are doing, taking, buying, schlepping, calling. It's not, you know, we don't ever have enough money for evaluation, and I think Elise can probably talk um, at length. Uh, she does, most of her career has been around the research of communications programs. So, I'm happy when there's a study and that there's something we can start with and we can say to a client, in three years you can see change, you know, three to five years. And that's the other realistic thing you have to, they're not gonna see it tomorrow. Um, yeah, I'll just um, add to what Jill said. It, a lot of it has to be managing expectations uh, about just what sort of change can you expect from a duration of an intervention if you're lucky, you might have three years. Some of them are six months. And so you do need to think, well, and in the meantime, you know that there's the, the biggest um, fear of your client is that some congressperson is going to stand up and say, why are they wasting money on, you know, going into bars and talking to sex workers about HIV prevention? Yeah. Or, you know, just add in your your thing in the blank there. Um, so they are desperate to show that they're being effective. So a lot of what you need to do is think of, well, what can you show that's changed? It has awareness of the issue at least changed. And you know, knowing that you are not, it's very rare where you have something with the length and the dollars that can really, really move the needle you know, just think of all the, you know, uh, obesity uh, prevention and control things that have been out. And yet, you know, we're, we're still seeing this epidemic happen. And it, it's because, you know, it, it's, it takes a long time. It needs a lot of dollars. The, the type of um, prevention campaigns that the government funds is like a minuscule fraction of what the food industry has to put towards all their promotion. And so you're not fighting fire with fire. It's uh, you know more like trying to put out a huge bonfire with a tiny little garden hose. So what, what can you do with it? And if you, the last thing you want to promise is that you're going to show a reduction in obesity or you're going to show you know a reduction in, in HIV. That's totally unrealistic. What you've got to do is take it apart, see what little components feed into that ultimate change that's going to happen maybe 20 years down the line, you know, beyond the scope of your project. And what is it that you can show some change? And again, you know, just managing those expectations uh, up top. Because, and you, <laughs> the other thing, Sharon, you, you could probably <laughs> back me on this. They usually don't give much money to do the evaluation, no. but they want the evaluation. So they expect you to pull a bunny out of a hat, you know. You say, you know I know you want to say no, no. something. This is, this is a good place where, I mean, if you're, if you're really working on these things, where you want to look for these public-private partnerships, right. because the private sector would, is looking for something to do, and they can do research where if you're working for the government, it's impossible to do the research. And so you really, that's an opportunity because, you know, we in the beginning told you how important it was to understand your audience, that's research. You know, if you want to know whether or not you're doing the right thing, that's research. And uh, the, the private sector does it. 
incessantly. Mm -hmm. There are lots of, and there's also a lot of ways you can do it much less expensively than the government thinks it needs to be done, you know, and, and where we would um, sometimes legally, sometimes not. You know, we do an omnibus study mm -hmm. just to get to track something, and I would always be looking for one measure that showed we were successful <laughs> and other measure to show what was really happening because you need to have data showing that you're successful to keep the program going when you're working in a social environment but you also really want to know what's working and what's not working and I think that there are some things that you can track but the you know I think the, the key here is that often the communication health communication is also always it's one part of a social movement where we're trying to address a social pro problem and we're just one small part of it and then you get these people who will say I want to know how is public relation how is the public relations campaign contributing to this you know versus how is the PSA mm -hmm. All right you're doing a PSA what's it contributed to this and you like I look at them and go you know guys this is like a clock and you're asking me to take the clock apart and tell you what piece is keeping the time. It doesn't work like that. You know, you need to have all the pieces to keep the time. And so now let's, I mean, because they really ask crazy for crazy things. And sometimes you just need to get a group of you together and say, oh, that is crazy, you know? <laughs> and, and, and see, I they once wanted to know, you know, if, you know, we're going to promote the 1-800 number, wonderful service, 1-800 for cancer. Call and get your information. And they wanted to know how was that going to reduce mortality of cancer in this country? Oh. And they're serious, you know. And you just go, <laughs> oh, really, you, you don't really you know? do that. Yeah. Oh my God! And so you know, but the more that this field becomes a field and comes together and has professionals that are speaking together as opposed to you're out there trying to do this and you're the only person, the better we're going to be because, you know, it is crazy. And we, and we do need to do more research. Okay, next, you know. I just, I mean, I don't want to leave us to, because I don't think this is anyone's intention, to leave the impression that um, research isn't important or that, um, that it's impossible. So, I mean, there's just a, a few things I would add. And one is that, um, you can't think about evaluating your program after you've done it. Um, when you're figuring out what you want to do, who you want to reach, what they're doing now that you either don't want them to do or you know want them to do something different, I mean, you need to plan that all out in the beginning and how you're going to measure it. And if you've got, you know, a national campaign, whatever that means. I mean, there are ways. So maybe you can do a small pilot study. You look at look at a few mm -hmm. sites and and write. To Sharon's point, you're not ever going to be able to say with any you know certainty the PR was responsible for you know an eighth of it, and then after that we had the um, iPhone app, which was responsible for another eighth of the you know reduction in, in obesity or you know whatever. I mean, that's beyond and and and. Sharon's right. I mean, you gotta just say to people like, no. But you gotta understand too. I mean, like if you're doing um, this work for the government, which often it is, um, you know, they're gonna get a question from Congress to justify the expenditure, and so um, you don't want that question to be the first time you're thinking about evaluating your program because that's gonna be um, a scramble. So you really do have to build it in in the beginning and and find a way to have some. Um, some measures short of, um, you know, did we reduce obesity among um, elementary school students um, nationally. Right. And it is really hard uh, to look at the numbers that you get. So you have media impressions, you know, so you are raising awareness, people are hearing your message or seeing your message. But one of the things that Elise said that I really liked, and we used to say this all the time, you want, you know, we had, uh, I launched Girl Power back in, like, when you were not probably alive yet. <laughs> like, so long ago, I can't even remember which president it was, but I think it was Secretary Shalala, and she was awesome and supported pretty much anything we wanted to do in those days. And nobody thought of talking to girls directly, 9 to 13-year-olds. They were catching up to boys and drug use at the time. There was a big issue. And I remembered sitting in rooms and thinking, well, how do you get, you know, I knew how to get girls. I was a girl once and knew a lot of them. But really, how do you get girls when we knew that they weren't on the Internet yet? But we didn't think that they wouldn't come to the Internet, but everybody else didn't think they would come to the Internet. And Girl Power was one of the very first 
all girl websites that, you know, and of course, if you put in the word girl, what do you get? A lot of naked girls and a lot of not inappropriate things. And it was very tricky to have the word, word girl in your URL because the pages that, you know, if you want to learn coding, go follow the porn industry because they are way ahead of any coders you will ever imagine. Bringing up and down sites in two minutes is a, a talent I, I'm still amazed by. Um, but so those things are also problems. That itself, girl power was a problem because it was always second to some girl, 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 something or other. But we would think about how are you gonna get a girl every day, all day long? And that's, you know, what Elise said is that you have to hear it on multiple levels from multiple sides. You know, so it was get her at school and on her way home and, you know, while she's with her friends and with her mom and at her sleepover. Those were the things that you have to think about. So, you know, in, in counting and measuring, you have to also add all the other people that you are influencing and talking to and through for this audience. Um, so that's, I just, it just came to my mind to think about that for a minute. Um, one last thing, an excellent book is um, a, a text uh, Ron Hornick from the Annenberg School of Communication. And I can't remember the title of the book. It has health communication in the title. Um, he has assembled um, really spot on case studies that help um, really shine a light on how to do things well, including the evaluation. You'll have to please forgive my ignorance, and I certainly hope I don't insult anybody's intelligence, but, and I've probably been out of school longer than you, so I don't know what social marketing is. I kind of have conjured up an idea listening to what you're saying, um, so I apologize. Um, I just, I am a, I'm a palliative care nurse, and I definitely attempt my best to reach an audience and talk about a topic that most people would prefer not to talk about. So if you could just maybe, in a very basic layman's terms, help me understand if there's, Sharon, I liked your comment with regard to offering people a benefit well, in exchange for behavior change. I've done a lot of work in the palliative care field. Haven't we? No. <laughs> and, and, and so it's a good, I mean, uh, uh, in two seconds, um, social marketing is the application of, you know, marketing, marketing principles um, uh, to, in, in this case, often communications, but even broader to social change programs. And the example I would give in with palliative care, um, the program was to increase the number, the, for those of you who don't know what palliative care yeah. is, it is um, providing uh, comfort care, symptom care, but along with treatment, uh, as opposed to hospice, where often it's palliative care, but you're not allowed under the hospice benefit, blah, 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 to get your treatment. So there's this whole palliative care movement to care for really, really, really sick people uh, but not necessarily make them stop, and it, so we can talk that definition. But the but the key was that we were trying to increase the number of uh, places within hospitals that offered palliative care programs, and so we through research found out there was really three different audiences. There was the hospital administrator, there was the physician who was the physician for the patient, and there was the family member. We were offering the same thing, a palliative care program but very differently because in marketing we'd say, well, what's the benefit? Well, for the hospital administrator, we could demonstrate that if you had palliative care, you know, often by keeping one person out of the intensive care unit for six months, you've saved your whole profit for the year. I mean, it's so expensive. And, and so for them, it was a dollar argument and a dollar benefit. For the physician, they saw no reason for this. They're perfectly good physicians. They know what they're doing. They're taking care of their patient. And we'd say, finally, is there nothing you don't need? I mean, I know you're a physician, but is there anything we could do for you? And they say, yes, get rid of the family. <coughs> These families are making us nuts. You know, we know what we're doing. We're taking care of the patient, and all the family wants to know is they're so worried, and they got questions, the people coming from California, da, da, da. Just take away the families. We're like, we can do that. 
we'd be happy to deal with the families because one of the things of palliative care is to help families make decisions and understand what's going on. And then for the families, <laughs> they were looking to help their family member. And that's what palliative care is all about. And so that from a marketing perspective, so that's taking a product, in this case a product, a service, a palliative care service, and through marketing, figuring out what were the benefits to three different segments that we had to hit to increase the number of programs. And, and, and so that's often where the, where the four P's really come in, because there was a product, there place, was a price, price place <laughs> there and was promotion, a right? promotion, and there was a place to get it. So when, when I talk the alien language of social marketing to my kids, they're like, well, what do you do? It's like, well, I'm trying to sell you not smoking, drinking, using a condom, wearing your seatbelt, like the people who sell you Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to do. So it's the same principles, but it's on different topics. And with a goal to have everybody be healthier and safer, and it's usually for the good of an individual or society. So that's the practice of social marketing. And it's theory-based, and there are many social marketing models. So there's the health belief model and the diffusion of innovations, and there's many, many, many of them. So when you actually find out what your problem is, and then you figure out what the barriers are, one of those models will apply, and it sort of helps you fit it into, you know, a little bit of a box. Educate. Yeah. Thank you. Well, of being able to teach people, you know, what would you put on the focus group guide to actually produce something that you could use and put together? You know, I always think, you know, they talk to you about doing research, and then you do the research, you figure stuff out, and you do your program. In real life, I've learned it's really much of greater help to try to go out and do your program, and all of a sudden it becomes really clear what you don't know. Um, again, when I went to NCI and I started out as a research director, so that's what I thought I was good at, I became a much better researcher after I had to run the programs. So in the morning, I designed a really good survey that I thought this was spot on for mammography. In the afternoon, I met with the program people and realized I just designed a study that told me nothing about what I needed to know to do the program. And that, I think, was a really insightful moment. And so you know, ever after, I started saying, now, what am I really trying to change here? Because if I, you know, and how would I do it? And then all of a sudden, it becomes clear what you don't know. And so. Paul, to, to me, that's one of the things. It, you know, research, sitting here by itself is nothing. It has to be so related to what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're now uh, fortunate enough to have uh, enough experience that's been published in the literature. So y you can find good measures. Measures are good questions, you know, that have been tested for reliability. You know, it does, does it work with this audience as well as this audience? And have been tested for validity. You know, is it really getting at what it is we want to measure? And so my first step is to go to the literature, um, do an environmental scan, realize that I mean, there's plenty of things you know, we work on all the time that is not nice and handy, and, and there's you know, good questionnaires that you can just take off the shelf. And you, you have to start from the beginning. But always you know, borrow from the ones that have been validated. Um, Gordon Willis at NCI, he's putting together um, a great database of questions that have gone through extensive cognitive interviews. That's something I recommend highly. If you have the budget, if you have the time, really it doesn't take a whole lot of time and money. These cognitive interviews where you'll sit down one-on-one -on -one with a person and get them thinking out loud as they read you know, the question and say, oh, well, it, do you want me to answer about this? Or I don't know, what, what does that word mean? It could mean this, it could mean that. So you know, take that step first to sort out any real red herrings you might have. Um, their database, I don't think it's, it's available yet, but they're, they're working to the point where everyone will have access to these you know, good measures that have been validated, have gone through this cognitive response. You can also look, um, 
uh, like for obesity prevention, there was uh, 2009, they came out with here are our standard questions that have been tested and, and have been tried. For HIV prevention, there are some global uh, measures. So if, you know, <laughs> thank goodness for Google Scholar, you just <laughs> type it in um, and you look to see how, uh, you know, it'll tell you very kindly how many people have used this and cited it. So that will give you a good idea of, you know, the validity of the instrument itself. Um, but uh, we're always searching for, <laughs> you know, what is that best question? <laughs> and it's a work in progress, but I, I think we've got some good tools to, to use now. I, I would add to that, it's kind of the corollary of what I said before, which is, you know, don't plan your program without mm -hmm. having your evaluators at the table to talk about uh, what you might try to measure in the end. I would say don't do your formative research without having your um, you know, strategic program planners at the table. Mm -hmm. um, so this is another thing that the government likes to do um, when awarding contracts. They like to give research piece to one firm mm -hmm. and they like to give, um, you know, campaign program development to another firm. And, you know, from an evaluation standpoint, uh, you can really, you know, understand that they want it to be completely unbiased, et cetera. Um, but I, I have, um, fought successfully um, a number of times to say that's all great but let me have a few hours on that research contract um, mm -hmm. because if they go and do the research and hand me a report it may or may not have the information I need in it. and it may or may not answer those questions that I need to no, and you know, a lot of times questions are around um, people's perceptions of, of the issue that you're talking about. Um, because, you know, it, it doesn't matter what you think and it doesn't matter what you think they think. You've got to hear it from them. You will not conduct research and not hear something that you haven't heard exactly. before. It's just impossible. And I mean, here's an interesting example. We were doing some focus groups once. Um, around an obesity campaign and one of the questions we decided to ask um, people who were by the way recruited for the focus groups based on their body mass index so these were people who met the definition of overweight or obese um, that was intentional and then one of the questions we asked early on in the in the focus group was um, what do these terms mean and I mean, to a person and to a group it was someone that was heavier than they were and I mean that that you know, is and you, you can kind of fill in the blanks with them if you're talking about various conditions or states of being, et cetera. So, um, you know, someone looking at it from a um, very sort of clean, strict research perspective may or may not have thought to ask that question. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, collaborating with you know, the people who are going to put all the pieces into the puzzle is is really, really important in figuring out where you need to go and what you need to ask. Somebody could write a novel about the classic disasters that have happened because the research was done over here and the program was done over here. I mean, there are just some classic um, crashes on that one. Yes. So I, I would like, I was going to say, I like what Elise was saying, though, about um, the uh, measurement and the quantitative and knowing what you're answering because one of uh, knowing what you're asking because one of my really my pet peeves is how they everybody wants to put on a focus group report warning <laughs> this is not projectable this is qualitative research this is not projectable and I say well then you know on every survey that is done I want a warning this is projectable, but we don't know what we've measured. <laughs> and, and there's this like bias that if it's quantitative, it's like better. And if it's an experiment, my God, it's gold. And, and in reality, that has got nothing to do with what it's really doing to inform you to help you build a program. And that, um, you know, the best studies, I, uh, research to support a program I've seen ha have been iterative. They have been um, multi-technique. You know, because they each give you something, you know, something different. And drinking alcohol is just like being obese. I mean, over drinking is more than what I drink. Mm -hmm. To a tea. At least <laughs> so one drink more. <laughs> uh, 
Paul, I would just add that um, in addition to sort of what to ask, it's in what setting are you going to ask it. So, you know, there's there's so many research methods you could use, and they're not all created equal for every audience. So, I was part of something, and you know, disclaimer: I wasn't at the firm that was planning the research. I was on the other side, but you know, we got to make suggestions, and here's one that didn't get taken. Um, this was to plan an inter, um, a, a campaign around um, intimate partner violence um, for middle, middle school students. And um, someone thought it would be a great idea to have um, sixth grade boys in a focus group talking about dating. Um, and they all just sat looking at the table um, because they were mortified that someone was, was asking this. And, and by the way, it was the right person asking the questions. It was a guy who was a former teacher. I mean, you know, that matters too. Who's asking the questions matters. Um, but, you know, depending what you want to know, maybe you've got to follow people around for a few days. Maybe you've got to have three people who know each other in a conversation. Um, sometimes focus groups work. You can do focus groups on the telephone, and sometimes that's a practical consideration, but sometimes it really works. Like, um, you know, if it's a situation uh, like uh, Jill was talking about with the members of the military where it's about an issue that they wouldn't necessarily want to disclose in a room full of people. Um, you know, if they can be anonymous on the telephone. So, you know, it's, it's matching the questions with what you need to get done. It's matching the research methods with who you need to ask. Um, and, um, you know, the, you got to put the puzzle together. We actually sent a bunch of people, I don't know if we were, if we worked on this campaign together or not, but we sent a bunch of people to food lion parking lots to get kids because they hang out there at night. Um, around a marijuana prevention campaign. They carried $5 bills. The, the focus group, um, the interviewers carried $5 bills like in a, you know, a, 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 a tummy pack or something. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what they did. But we made sure that they were really young looking people who looked kind of cool. And, you know, that's also, you know, picking the people who do the interviewing is really key. So we picked the youngest employees that we had at the company at the time. We sent them to, you know, Reva focus group moderating class and we sent them out to the food line parking lots and that's how we got these kids to respond to us. We could not get them to talk for the life of us and that was the the best way to do it. In the Pentagon, we sent our again young best looking women and our very dashing men to walk around the Pentagon and find service members who were willing to talk. And that's what we, you know, people who were badged to get in, they walked around for days and found the places that people were like not talking their work, but were actually socializing and relaxing. So it is, you'll be surprised where you'll end up trying to get research done. <laughs> Food line parking lots, very good. Do you have a question? Hi, my name is Ratna. Um, thank you all for speaking. It's a very interesting panel. I'm currently a master's student in public health and communication, but I've also worked at the DC Department of Health and AAD on just health commu communication programs. But my question for you all is, one, I guess when you look back at the past 10, 15 years, so much has changed in this field and there's so many new things. So what do you see looking forward? I feel like there are things constantly changing. How is this field gonna change over the next five, 10, 15 years? And also, our audiences are also being bombarded with information about every different program, whether it be Coca-Cola or our social marketing um, programs. How are we, if we want to get a message across, how are we really going to get like the obesity message? How are we going to get that message across when they're all being just kind of, they have to being, I guess, getting all these different messages to them? Well, I'll answer the second part of the question first. I, I think that doesn't really change. Um, it, it may be, you know, it, at, at once it gets easier to reach people and harder to reach the right people at the right time with the right message because there are so many choices because they can turn it off because, um, but, you know, when Sharon was uh, talking about the palliative care example, it was, it, it's the same. It is finding out from the people what they need, what they want, what they know, what the challenges are, and, 
and you got to be straight about it, right? Time. Okay, um, I, I've worked on a number of physical activity campaigns, you know, maybe five, eight years ago, and consistently time was a huge barrier for people, you know, so you have to find other ways. We cannot give you more time. Now, if you tell me it's time away from your friends and family, then I can give you a campaign that shows you how to be physically active with those people and, um, you know, still get that time. Um, the channels, I mean, it, it sort of harks back to what I was saying in my video in the beginning, which is don't be dazzled. Choose the right channels. Um, and, and it's hard, you know, you, you have to maintain the courage of your convictions and you have to be willing to um, say no, if you, if you can. I mean, I've worked my entire career in a, in a consulting kind of environment. So, you know, m my audience needs are one thing and what my clients want us to do to get paid is another, you know, it needs to be taken into consideration. Um, but I would say just try to find that balance and, and it really goes back to what we, we've all been saying uh, all along, is that you cannot choose your channels if you don't know who you're talking to. Um, so um, focus. <laughs> I mean, I remember writing a proposal when MTV you know, changed its programming and, and did everything and was not just music videos. And it was you know, fast and furious. And I remembered the first line of the proposal was something about the MTV age and how we're getting snippets of information. It, it, it's still the same, even though, you know, but it's just, it's more, but it hasn't really changed. Things are at that same quick clip and you have to get them, you know, in that I call it the soft shell crab, you know, thing. It's, it's you really want to get them when they're in the middle of getting to that new place. So, you know, am I ready to quit? Am I going to, am I going to wear my seatbelt today? You, you have to find that person while they're making that move and you have to be fast about it and you have to be deliberate about it. So I don't think anything's going to get slower. I think it's all going to keep moving at this clip and it makes it, I think, more fun for those of us in this field to be able to evaluate the tools and the tactics that are available and to be able to reach the most, you know, rural population out, you know, on a on either a reservation or, you know, where there isn't, you know, Wi Fi everywhere. They're still, you know, advertising on paper bags in the shopping, you know, in the grocery store. So everything old is new again and everything new has its time so don't you know, you know I would not be I would not be afraid of the new things embrace mm -hmm. them but put them all in their place I think I think we're going to need to have a paradigm shift I think that if we're serious in the health field about actually helping people be healthy then we have to be willing to do what it takes to achieve that objective right as opposed to wanting people to be help, wanting people to want to be healthy you know I, I worked on the five a day campaign and and you talk to these folks and you say they just want to know what to eat mm -hmm. and they'd say well we can't do that mm -hmm. we have to teach them nutrition because what happens the next time they want to eat they won't know what to do mm -hmm. you know and you think no actually they just want to know what to eat you know you drive a car do you know how to take apart your carburetor no but you drive the car right okay people just want to know what to eat and, and we are so passionate sometimes about our issues and health and want you know we want them to want this as opposed to just being able to achieve those objectives so again back to the, our, the palliative care and end of life you know one one of the keys you know we have learned through research is that if you want people to have better end of life care you better stop talking about end of life care <laughs> because it means nothing to anybody and it's not me so it's like the make a wish foundation giving away giving away wishes to children who are dying couldn't give away a one as soon as they made it for children who are suffering from serious illness they don't have enough wishes to give away why, you know why because you know and so if we can paradigm shift and say we really want this country to become healthier as opposed to a country who wants to become healthier, I think we're going to make a huge difference. And Johns Hopkins is a perfect place to start that kind of thinking. I uh, I agree with you. I remember watching, you know, an ad on obesity, and 
as soon as I watched the PC PSA, immediately followed a very tantalizing oh, ad of chocolates and ice creams. Yeah. I mean, you know, there went PSA. And I, I just saw my little sister going to the refrigerator and taking out the ice cream tub and, you know, eating. So um, we, we have a question from our online audience. Um, uh, and then we'll take your question. Okay, we have a uh, question that's come in from one of our students who is watching us online from Haiti. And she asks, who are the leading NGOs or projects? I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Who are the leading NGOs or projects that are using social marketing in the developing world? And what are the new promising innovations and campaigns? Um, Definitely USAID is uh, one of the biggest funders of the social marketing, as well as um, the Bill and Melinda Gates campaign. Um, I'm sorry, their, their foundation. Um, but the types of um, organizations that actually go and do the work for these foundations, um, you want to, well, AED, it will be changing names if you've been <laughs> hearing about the news there. Um, they're one of the biggest in, in the international field. Um, PSI, which I mentioned before, that was the one with the HIV prevention project that I had the opportunity to work on. APT, uh, A-B-T is how it's spelled. Um, Ogilvy does some international work, and um, oh, I'm missing. Like federal agencies, CDC. I think yes, they, they, they do sponsor it, yeah, but then they'll hire. Yeah. Now, Johns Hopkins, of course, has a very, very active and competitive um, uh, global program, yes. And they, they do very fine work. Um, PATH is another one that does very, very good work. Um, so those are the ones that come to top of mind. Can you think of any others that I've missed? Priyanka, can you think of some? I mean, I, I work with the Department for International Development. Um, mm -hmm. That's a British agency. Oh, yeah, DFID. ODA, yeah, yeah, DFID. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I would just say they're also not, you know, only doing work in the health field. So there's a lot of organizations that you find, um, you know, based in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., that are um, doing work in what um, is called something like civil society, right. um, where um, they really are, you know, changing hearts and minds mm -hmm. on um, what is the um, – culture of our society going to be and what is our legal system going to be like and uh, you know in places where um, let's just say there's been some transition from one system to um, another um, and uh, the names escape me um, but I mean there are a lot of groups here in DC that mm -hmm. do that kind of work um, uh, John Snow Oh yes, that's um, another. And um, Rockwell International, mm -hmm. um, you know, again, some of the work not necessarily in health, but in energy and in um, clean energy. You know, getting um, buses in Delhi to convert to national natural gas. I mean, these mm -hmm. kinds of things. So um, it's really quite um, broad when you get into the international. Um, arena. I would suggest uh, for this um, person who asked the question, uh, I know everything's very difficult right now in Haiti, but if you have the opportunity to talk to some of the people um, in the Department of Health, they could probably point this person to, you know, who is doing work, who would like to take on, you know, some people to help. Um, and uh, I'll just put in a pitch for, you know, volunteering in a developing country. It's one of the most satisfying things you can do. Um, it's, um, it really just gives you the perspective that can take you through life in this crazy society we live in here. Thank you. Uh, Hi. Um, 
Thanks for uh, being here tonight. It's been really interesting. Um, my name's Jenna Norton. I'm with Hager Sharp. Um, I'm doing health communications, mm -hmm. uh, primarily for the National Diabetes Education Program. My question for you um, is we sort of touched on some of the environmental barriers that exist for people to actually act on behavior change. And I guess my question for you guys is to what extent do you think we could use marketing principles to target people who are um, effectors of policy change and people who actually make policy. I mean, do we need to have a well thought out conversation with these people or can we use marketing to kind of convince them that these changes are changes that need to happen? Um, I'll start off on this because I've recently been working on some projects for CDC and that is one agency that seems to, and this kind of addresses the question earlier, if I do see a shift I'm seeing a shift, at least with this very large agency, they're shifting away from individual behavior change to more of the macro. And that's the policy, environment, the built environment, and, and structure. The answer to your question is yes. You know, these same principles that we use in social marketing, you segment. You know, is it the health state departments? Is it Congress people? Is it the local community activists that you want to motivate? Uh, one project um, I worked on very recently is, you know, it's a community prevention. Uh, these communities received uh, local grants and uh, I was part of the project that had a national campaign that was going to support um, uh, or will will support. It's <laughs> taken for various reasons. It's taken a long time to get off the ground. Uh, it's going to support all these community efforts with these wonderful, wonderful. Um, uh, it, not PSAs. They're buying advertising time, and when when you see them, it'll knock your socks off. Um, but we made very clear uh, going into this. We had to define the audience first. And so after doing our environmental scan and talking to people in the field, we um, went to two audiences. One was parents. And with further research, we found the people who you could really motivate are parents of children 8 to 15 years old. If they're younger than 8, you know, they, they think they've got control over everything already. If they're older than 15, they're long gone. So not only is it that age group, it's parents where, you know, uh, or households where uh, uh, if it's single parent or, or, or two parents, they're both working. They're overwhelmed. They know they want to do something right. They don't have time. They don't know what to do. And you know, here is now in place um, a community group that's going to say, here's what you can do to help put healthy foods in schools. Here's what you can do to make a nice playground out of an industrial wasteland. Here's what you can do you know, to get together and make sure that you have access and people in the inner cities have access to fruits and vegetables. And so that was one target audience. So whole set of strategies, you know, just for them. The other set were the people who we called the community activists. And maybe nothing to do with obesity prevention and control. Could be, you know, people who are concerned about getting jobs for uh, minorities. People who are concerned about uh, domestic violence. But they're already active. You know, build that bridge with them. And it was, you know, just the same sort of tech, uh, techniques that we use. Know your audience. Know what's going to make it easy for them to move forward. And know what's going to, you know, really help them what they do. And with the um, government people, usually you want to make them look smart. You give them information so that they can look smart, you know. You know, Cong Congress is tricky, but they're important. And some of the things that we were able to do, so the grant programs are really great. So you send a letter to the congressman who's, you know, state or community got those grants so that the congressman knows that they're now involved in this issue and they can take a stake in it. So sometimes they don't even know what's going on. And there are things that you can do with Congress and there's things that you can't do. So figuring out, you know, can you have or, or host an event, um, you know, in the Rayburn building about your program and you have it sponsored by two members of Congress. We've done that before. We've 
done info packets. You can't call them anything else, but it helps them understand what your issue is. Oftentimes they're funding them, but they don't get down to this granular level and they really don't know. But how great is it to be able to talk about this community got you know $5,000 and these are the th great things that they're doing and if they're traveling to that state, they can bring the mom and the kid and they can have a conversation in front of the media. You know, there's great ways to tie in and yes, it is using all the same principles of marketing. So I think yes, you can do that and you should when, you, when it's not advocacy and you're not looking like you're bribing a congressman. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I, um, okay, this is one last question. Um. Yes, my last question. Thank you very much. My name is Liliana Campos Dudley. I, I work for APT Associates. Um, first of all, I just want to put a pitch for the fact that when you do communications campaigns, they usually are in the context of a program. So hopefully uh, the barriers that you identified can be broken or provided for by the program. So you don't feel situations when you encourage people to do something and that something does not exist. That number one. Number two, uh, how transferable is what you are teaching to other fields? You know, social marketing, health communication, what about agriculture, food security, disaster relief. Could you talk a little bit about that? I mean, yeah, it's very transferable. I mean, we're stealing. We're st health is stealing <laughs> from other areas that have been using this for a long time. And and you know, because again, if it's if you're trying to change behavior, th this is where marketing comes in. So, if you're targeting people, you want people to do something different, marketing can be a really helpful tool regardless of the topic. And Jill had mentioned um, sort of scientific um, models that are used sometimes, these models of health behavior, for example. Um, so it's interesting she mentioned diffusion of innovations where you look at, you know, who's likely to adopt something early and, and how does that um, information or product use trickle down. And that actually came from agriculture and the adoption of different agricultural products and farming methods. Um, so you know, it is. I mean, it's all a matter of um, what's happening now, what do we want to have happen, who needs to change or get on board or do something, what, what is in it for them, uh, them, and I don't mean that in a very calculated kind of way, though sometimes it is, um, but um, they've got to see a benefit and they've got to be willing to give up whatever that cost is, if it's money, if it's time, if it's space on a grocery store shelf. Um, There's a whole other issue there, but because um, people pay for space on gross, specific space on grocery store shelves, but don't get me started. Um, um, you know, that, that speaks to like addressing some of those environmental barriers. So, I mean, I think it really is, and it has been used in, um, like I was saying, sort of energy efficiency um, in the developing world. Um, and it's, you know, if there's a pattern you want to change, if there's an attitude you want to change, if there's a behavior you want to change, then I think, um, you know, it's maybe not like I'm going to take this program and just overlay it whole hog on this issue, but there are threads that are going to be useful. Thank you. Um, I would now like to thank all our panelists for such an insightful discussion um, and all our audience for being there uh, for this uh, coming here and listening to this uh, roundtable. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for the good questions.